on this episode of the End of Tourism podcast. And whatever sustainability started out meaning, it ends up meaning sustaining the ways of living of the Western middle classes at all costs, as if that were either possible and desirable, along with this fake promise that everybody else will have this soon. Even as the reality is that these ways of living are unraveling under the feet of a large part of the Western middle classes right now. So it's not about sustaining the ways of living of the Western middle classes. It's about negotiating the surrender of these ways of living. Welcome to the End of Tourism podcast, season three, Invocations. This season features a deeper dive into the crevices of exile, wanderlust, and radical hospitality with diverse authors, activists, and storytellers. For some, tourism can entail learning, freedom, and financial survival. For others, it means the loss of culture, land, and lineage. Our conversations explore the unauthorized histories and consequences of modern travel. These are dispatches from the resistance. You can listen and subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any major podcast platform. You can follow us on social media via the handle The End of Tourism. And if you want to continue to see the project grow, you can support us via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash The End of Tourism. I'll be your host, Chris Christou. Today, my guest is Dougald Hine, a social thinker, writer, and speaker. After an early career as a BBC journalist, he co-founded organizations including The Dark Mountain Project and A School Called Home. He has collaborated with scientists, artists, and activists, serving as a leader of artistic development at Riksteatern, Sweden's National Theatre, and as an associate of the Center for Environment and Development Studies at Uppsala University. His latest book is At Work in the Ruins, Finding Our Place in the Time of Science, Climate Change, Pandemics, and All the Other Emergencies. He co-hosts the Great Humbling Podcast and publishes a substack called Writing Home. Welcome, Dougal, to the End of Tourism Podcast. It's good to be here. It's good to have you. Could you offer us a little glimpse into the place you're speaking from today, both geographically and personally? Yes, I am sitting here in the dark north, considerably further north than where I grew up in the northeast of England. I looked it up the other day and realized that when you take the bus that runs about 30 times a day backwards and forwards between the city of Uppsala, which is our nearest big place, and Ostavola, which is the small town of about 1,500 people where we live, that bus crosses the invisible line that marks 60 degrees north. So that's how far up we are. So it's pretty dark at this time of year. It's certainly dark at this time of evening. And I am speaking to you from a library in a shoe shop that has become or is in the process of becoming a school called home. So this is both our home as a family and also the place from which we are slowly growing this funny little kind of teaching house and gathering place and learning community for people who are drawn to the work of regrowing a living culture. Mm. Well, I've had the great good honor of having some friends speak to me about, about your work and school and, of course, your new book, At Work in the Ruins. But uh, before we get into that, I'd like to ask you, perhaps as a way of grounding us in notions of travel, tourism, migration, I'd like to begin by asking you about your own earthly movements. It seems that much of your travels have been undertaken in and for the social movements of our times. And uh, my question is, how have your travels shaped your understanding of our current dilemmas? Well, I suppose if I look back from this vantage point of my mid-40s, there was a first chapter of travelling for me that began in my late teens, which was travelling to feel free, 
traveling to get lost, but also traveling because I was lost. I had an inarticulate sense of lack that hovered between being just a background, this is just what the world is like, and coming into the foreground as something I could begin to see and place within a history. And probably what gave me a chance of even getting onto that path was having grown up around churches and having grown up around the just the gentle background echoes of a very old prophetic tradition that even in a very quiet, ordinary, small town in the northeast of England, in the church where my dad was a minister, was somehow echoing through my life from childhood and creating this this distance between how things are and how they're intended to be. I think you can hear the echoes of that so often in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament and wherever you end up in relation to Christianity as an institutional religion, that can, if you're lucky, set you on a helpful path towards being able to approach this world as you find it. If you're born in a country like England in a time like the late 20th century, as I was, you know, it, it can allow you some distance, some questioning of that, which you might not get from many other places in that society at that moment in time. So I began traveling and my first big journey, I was 18. I had finished my final exams in high school. I had a year before I needed to take up my place at university. I packed my rucksack and took my guitar and set off and for 10 months traveled around Europe as a street musician utterly lost, just wandering in and out of places, not knowing how to read them, not knowing how to place anything I was learning really within much of a context, just bumping into people and into experiences. And every now and again, those were opening doors rather than just leading to bafflement. And that kind of way of being and way of traveling probably continued into my mid twenties. And then at a certain point, I'd begun to find some kind of compass bearing, even if I didn't have any good maps. And so I was traveling with more intention to, to meet people and follow up on paths. I got involved in activism closer to home. And when the big global summits came to the British Isles, I would go. But I was not, never one of these people who was kind of each year going to the different country where the G7 or the G8 were having their meetings. But I began to travel, well, really to to find and meet the friends of Ivan Illich, actually. Mm. You know, in 2007, on my 30th birthday, I stumbled across an invitation to a gathering that was happening two weeks later in Cuernavaca to mark the fifth anniversary of Illich's death and sent an email to this guy, Jean Robert, and he wrote back to me and said, come, of course. And I borrowed the money for the flight to Mexico from my parents and got on a plane and came to this country where I didn't speak the language and didn't know anybody and was welcomed for my foolishness. That was kind of the ticket of entry that made these amazing people curious about this funny English kid who had shown up at this gathering. And then, you know, not that many years later, I almost came to the end of traveling. When I met my partner, Anna, she'd been living around Europe and the Middle East, away from home for 12 years, and had finally moved back to Sweden the year before she met me. So like, when this English guy who had only been together with her for six months decided he was going to try moving to Sweden, you can bet that her parents did all within their power to make me feel welcome and at home because they didn't want her to leave again. And as I began to land in Sweden, for both of us, I think the promise that traveling had held for us up to that point in our lives had begun to fade. And we'd begun to feel this call to find somehow a way, even in these times, to be in place. 
And I remember that decision happened in Oaxaca mm -hmm. in 2012, at the end of our first year of living together in Stockholm. I had come out to Oaxaca to work on this book called The Crossing of Two Lines and to record some interviews with Gustavo Esteva, who I know that you knew well. Mm -hmm. And... Anna came out to join me for the last three weeks of that because her work had also, we'd both been working very internationally that year. And at the end of three weeks, we realized that was the longest single stretch of time we had spent together in the year and a half since we met. And we weren't even on the right continent. And we said to each other, it's time to come home. It's time to make Sweden home and not just treat it as a hotel that we return to from these you know, in many ways, wonderful and meaningful things that were taking us around. And I remember a few years after that, it must have been about 2015, emailing with Gustavo. And I was like almost apologetic for the fact that I wasn't traveling to any of the gatherings that Friends of Village were organizing really anymore. And I remember just getting this reply from him where I just felt this sense of blessing of him kind of saying to me, no, like when people like you from countries like yours finally figure out the importance of staying home and being in place and being with family rather than wandering rootlessly around the world all the time and coming to us for the answers that might actually be one of the seeds that holds some promise i don't remember how he actually said it but that was the blessing that i took so that's like three chapters traveling to get lost and because i was lost and then beginning to follow a thread and then reaching the point where the appetite for those experiences was waning and the pull of finding a way of being in place was beginning to claim me. Wow. What a thing. Mm. Where to go from there? Well, I guess, Dougal, I'd like to ask you about your new book, At Work in the Ruins, Finding Our Place in the Time of Science, Climate Change, Pandemics, and All the Other Emergencies. I'd like to ask on behalf of our listeners, what's influenced the inception or the inspiration for this book? And what, if anything, in regards to what you just told us, influenced your willingness to write in this way? Well, the book had its inception at a very specific moment. I can't tell you exactly what time it was, but it was a Friday morning in September 2021, and I was walking around a particular corner of a field that is about 800 yards from where I'm sitting here in the house in the shoe shop. And I was talking over Zoom with my dear friend Felix Marcard, who is the author of a book called The New Nomads and always describes himself as a recovering Davos junkie. And he means it kind of literally in multiple ways. He's been in recovery from substance abuse and he's written and spoken about that. And he was also part of the World Economic Forum and this kind of very high powered global networks that he spent you know, the first 20 years of his adult life right in the middle of in various ways. And as he went into recovery, he began to realize that, oh, he hadn't been this kind of high functioning addict who'd been doing all of that stuff in spite of his substance addiction. It was all part of the same thing. This addiction to power and proximity to power was just the same as the substances he'd been putting into his body. And he had this very strange journey of writing a book that had been commissioned as a celebration of globalist nomadism and halfway through discovering people like Wes Jackson at the Land Institute and Wendell Berry and then finding his way through Vanessa Andriotti to me and, and like having to write this book that undermined its own original proposition. So anyway, I talked to Felix a lot. And that morning I was describing to him this sequence of four conversations I'd had over recent days that were all in one way or another conversations with people about climate change journalists researchers people organizing an event that i was invited to speak at and i just reached this point and i remember the words coming out of my mouth i think it's time to stop talking about climate change 
And as I heard myself say it, I said, ah, but I'll have to write something to explain how that could possibly be the case. And Felix said to me, yes, yeah, you really have to write that. And I thought I was writing an essay that was a kind of farewell to this work that had been part of my life for 15 years or so. And in three days, I wrote three chapters. And then I realized it wasn't an essay, it was going to be a book. And so the book grew out of attempting to answer that question, how can someone who is deeply troubled about you know, the, the mess the world is in, including the parts of that mess that show up under the name of climate change, and who has spent a lot of his life standing on stages or sitting on Zoom calls or you know, off the record, or on the record, through writings and essays and conversations, talking to people about climate change, reach a point where that had stopped making sense. And I had to explain that to myself. And that involved retracing the paths of my life through those years and the encounters and noticing things that I maybe hadn't given as much significance to at the time in order to tell this story, which is not telling anyone what they should or shouldn't talk about. And obviously, I end up saying quite a lot about climate change in this book, but it is nonetheless a calling into question of what seems obvious, which is that this is such an urgent and terrifying prospect and so important that it needs to be the defining frame within which we talk about the trouble the world is in and what needs to be done about it. Mm. So that's where the book came from and what it became. Mm. Well, I'm curious. I haven't delved too deep into it as far as statistics are concerned, but we have had a couple of guests on the pod speaking directly about tourism in the context of the consequences of climate change. And I know in Europe and the UK specifically, there are some pretty strong movements against air travel in general, certainly with its nuances and details. And I'm just wondering how often those critiques or that analysis shows up in the climate change discussion, or if it shows up at all, given that tourism and the vacation tends to be kind of this last bastion of freedom among Western and modern people. Yeah, I mean, here in Sweden, we kind of invented this concept of flug scum, which is flight shame. And... Uh, obviously, not least because of the moral leadership of Greta Thunberg, there has been a sense, a very strong sense here and likewise in the Extinction Rebellion movement and the rest of what has been going on in the UK in recent years. And obviously that's spread in many other Western countries where there are significant parts of the population who you know, really either are not flying or would not likely get on a plane in the way they might have done five years ago. And to the extent that it becomes a real conversation about giving up entitlements, like the entitlement to that way of moving fast around the world, I think it can be really helpful because obviously that's, you know, that's part of what is at stake. You know, this is one of the things I was saying in some of the talks that I was giving during the period that I write about in the book is you know, whatever sustainability started out meaning, it ends up meaning sustaining the ways of living of the Western middle classes at all costs, as if that were either possible and desirable, along with this fake promise that everybody else will have this soon even as the reality is that these ways of living are unraveling under the feet of a large part of the Western middle classes right now. So I was saying, it's not about sustaining the ways of living of the Western middle classes. It's about negotiating the surrender of these ways of living and making a deliberate choice not to fly in a society that looks at you strangely for that is a way of getting some skin in the game, a way of telling yourself and those who know you that you're serious about it. Now, I was involved in some conversations a while back about artistic and cultural touring. Mm. 
I worked with the Swedish National Theatre for a couple of years on this project where I basically had a lot of freedom to explore the question of the roles of art under the shadow of climate change. And I had a real crisis because we were bringing amazing guest artists to Sweden as part of this, but some of them were getting on planes to come here to do workshops that I was organizing that were about this. And I started to feel ill from the contradiction of it. And out of that came an idea that is not quite landed, but I keep telling the story of it because people will pick it up or will recognize where it is happening in different ways already anyway. And it was the idea of something we called Silk Roads of Stories, where at the moment, to the extent that not flying is a thing in the worlds of art and culture. And there can be such a strong entitlement and sense of the virtue and importance of what you're doing in the cultural sphere, such that, you know, obviously you're entitled to be flying here, there and everywhere around the world. To the extent that people were calling it into question, what that looked like in practice was that a small number of committed people were getting on trains and making three day journeys from one side of Europe to the other and then back again to go to an event where most of the other people were coming in by plane. And I was like trying to just switch out the flying bit as if the rest of what we're doing is great and is exactly how we should be doing it. And I don't even mean in terms of sustainability targets or any of that. I don't even mean in terms of carbon emissions. I just mean in terms of being humans together. Like, can we just admit that actually it's quite shit when you come into a city and go from the airport to the hotel and then from the hotel to the conference venue or the museum or gallery or whatever it is and spend time with a bunch of other people who've come into that city from all different directions and then go back to your hotel, sit up late in the bar and then the next morning get up, go in a taxi to the airport and fly back to the city that you left. But that's just... That's it's not even enjoyable. It's not a good way of visiting a place. You haven't touched the place when you go there like that. So what if culture crosses borders closer to the ground than that? Not just because we're not flying anymore, but because uh, it will become culture in a way that really means something and is true when we remember how to travel slower and closer to the ground and do events that are more grounded in and bring us more deeply into contact with the spaces that we're visiting when we're the ones who are the, you know, the journeyers, the traveling artists or storytellers or human beings, whatever, you know, somehow we miss a trick if we try and solve it just at the level of looking at the carbon emissions and taking those out and keeping it as close as possible to the way we're living now. Because even if the IPCC were to turn around tomorrow and say, guys, we screwed up, turns out we can release as many CO2 emissions as we want and the climate system will just absorb it and even out. Like, we'd still be living in absurd and counterproductive and self-destructive ways. So... If we start from there, there might be more energy than if we start from trying to solve it by just removing the carbon emissions from a way of living and pretending that way of living is the best thing that the world has ever seen, which is mostly how it's talked about today. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I often wonder about the old pilgrimages and the old pilgrims and, you know, how on the walking paths that so many other pilgrims have, had walked previous to them, that they inhabit and shift with the changing weather and dialects or languages and food and culture and geographies and calendars that they encounter on their way. Perhaps in the context of art and culture that you're speaking of that maybe in the past and maybe still today, there are times when that movement is kind of like a snowball and that so much of that shifting nature of the pilgrimage is collected and gathered up on the way to, oh, if you want to call it the destination or the altar, right? There's a little quote I found, well, actually, it's not a quote, it's your writing from your new book that I'd like to read. I think it exemplifies what you just said very, very beautifully. And uh, there in At Work in the Ruins, you write, I found myself needing to redraw the maps by which I had been steering 
tracing the fault lines that will matter most in the years ahead. It seemed to me that the image of the fish tank could help in drawing the line. Those of us who are not willing to contribute to the project of remaking the world as a fish tank, as an object of total human management, need to find ways of speaking and acting that offer another direction of travel. I think that's, that's there in the, in the crucible of, of your wondering throughout, throughout the book. Mm, thank you for picking up on that passage. Yeah, that's, that's one of the bits that's right at the heart of it. Mm. I know we don't have a huge amount of time together today, so I'd like to return back, if we can, to a couple of the names you mentioned a little bit earlier, because I don't imagine that other people might be able to own in on these relationships. I'd like to mention the work of a man whom we are both very familiar with, whom we were both very familiar with, the late elder and activist Gustavo Esteva, who our last season, season two, Mexico, was dedicated to. And Gustavo spoke and wrote on occasion about hospitality as the basis or root foundation of any achieved encounter between peoples. And to the extent that hospitality is the basis for truly successful social movements. He also spoke of the limits of hospitality, or the limits to hospitality, and that if hospitality was taken advantage of, either by the guest or the host themselves, that hostility would be the result. I'd love if you could offer us a little reflection on your time in with Gustavo and what place do you think hospitality has to play in our current work? Thank you. Yeah. As you were speaking that, I was being drawn back to a conversation with somebody else who I know learned from and had great love for Gustavo, my friend Vanessa Andreotti, who we were talking a while back and she was talking about a conversation that she had had as a Brazilian scholar from an indigenous background with a Canadian indigenous scholar and activist who she was working with where they were like, yeah, it seems like part of, part of the legacy we're dealing with is that when these folks showed up, you know, when these seaborn barbarians as the white folks from Europe who went out, who had no exports that the rest of the world was interested in other than violence. You know, when we showed up on other people's shores 500 years ago, and still in the way that we often show up today, it's as though we can only conceive of two modes of encounter, two modes of exchange or economic relationship or however we want to call it, where the one is the exchange of money for goods, the commodity encounter. And the other one is the gift, but the gift conceived like the free gift in a cereal box. And the paradox here is like the power of money is precisely that once we're normalized to living in a highly monetized society, we use money as a tool to sever relationship. I go into Starbucks and I don't have to worry about, I don't have to think about whether the person on the other side of the counter feels like making me a cup of coffee because I can give them a $5 bill. Mm. And that is the power of money. And it allows the social activity of a society to accelerate to a pace which would be impossible if we had to pay attention to how everyone was feeling in all of the encounters that make up our days. And we could, you know, being generous, invoke what Gustavo's friend Ivan Illich used to talk about as the threshold of counterproductivity and say, up to a certain point, this innovation of money may have been a good thing. The question is not, should we abolish all money? Should we remove all money from the world? The question is, have we passed the threshold where the negative consequences of it are actively outweighing the gains that it might have brought in the beginning. And the way to ask that is to look around and go, are the problems that our societies have the result of us having to spend too much time paying attention to how the others involved in our encounters feel? Or is it the other way round? And if it's the other way round, then we're probably a long way over that threshold of counterproductivity when it comes to this thing called money. Mm. 
But the paradox is, you know, if the seaborne barbarians show up with that as the one way that things can pass between people and with the other as the free gift in the cereal box, i.e. the gift that has no strings attached, then both of those are about the absence of relationship. You know, European philosophers spent so much time in the 17th century in the wake of these transatlantic encounters theorizing about the state of nature as if the people they had encountered across the sea were living in a state of nature. The people they had encountered were living in a state of culture that they couldn't even recognize. And so you walk into a culture where somebody gives you something and that is an act of hospitality that weaves you into a set of obligations that cannot be reduced to money. It's like Illich said about the old law of the commons in Europe. He said it was a law that could not be, it was a law that was never written down, both because people did not care to, in other words, it didn't need to be written down, and because it reflected a reality too complex to fit into paragraphs. Mm-hmm. So Gustavo, when I sat down with him in 2012 to record these conversations one of the first things he said was you know the beginning of this story of these encounters is a story of hospitality abuse Mm -hmm. and if we are going to meet each other and learn from each other and get real about how we ended up in the trouble the world is in then that has to be like the centrality of that to the story of what happened when the seaborne barbarians turned up it has to be told and allowed to sit centrally in the story. Because just as you say, we have to recover, we have to recover hospitality, but hospitality is not like foolish you know, setting yourself up for more and more exploitation. Hospitality is what disappears, what recedes like wild animals vanishing back into the forest when you show up being loud and exploitative. So I met Gustavo in 2007 when I made that first journey to Mexico for the gathering of the Friends of Illich. And then I met him again in London a year or so later when he came to give a talk and I saw all these people who are calling themselves social entrepreneurs and traveling out from a city like London to do good and create projects that would save lives and the rest of it around the world, utterly like bewildered and angered by what he was trying to tell them about the reality of the development project, the way that it's just, you know, the latest set of words for the same processes that have been playing out for 500 years And I then, yeah, traveled back to visit him these two more times in Cuernavaca. And the the thing that I've realized through writing the book and even more through beginning to talk about the book with people is that perhaps the greatest gift that I got from that was hearing him tell the story that he told so many times about the three turnings of his life when he walked away first from being... You know, the youngest ever IBM executive or whatever he was at the age of 22. And then a few years later from the Marxist guerrilla group after witnessing one of the leaders murder another and seeing what the violence that was implicit in their political strategies would look like on the scale of a society. And then the third time turning down the job in the Mexican government when he was about the age that I am now to go and work in the barrios in Mexico City and be part of these grassroots movements that he dedicated the rest of his life to. And what struck me hearing him tell it that afternoon on the porch of the house in the village was, it was so clear that he had no answers to offer anybody at that moment of turning away. He couldn't explain it to himself or to anyone else in a way that he was satisfied with when he turned down this job as a cabinet minister or something in 1976. He just knew. He knew from his gut. And I began to recognize from thinking about that story that there are times when you have to give up and walk away without being able to give any good account of why you're doing this. 
either to yourself or to anyone else. The only account you can give is that that vital compass in the gut that is pointing in a different direction. And the reason why you can give no good account of it is because until you have walked away from the position you're in, you won't be able to see the things that you're not seeing from there. Like you have to actually make that move, risking that it will never make sense again, risking that this is a form of going mad in order to have the chance and never the guarantee that you will arrive at a place from which you can see other possibilities. Now, I say in the book, and this goes back to that lesson from Gustavo, giving up is always giving up on something. Though at the time, it may well feel like everything, because you'll only find out that it wasn't everything once you have crossed that threshold or that abyss into the unknown the unknown world that comes after the end of the world as you know it and that that shift can happen in the scale of your own lifetime as gustavo told us so well with that story of the turnings and it can happen on the scale of cultures and within historical processes as well thank you do and i'd like to ask then in the context of your own life in the context of your own turnings I don't know how many it might be at now, but I'm curious in regards to your move, your migration to Sweden previously, you know, being born and raised in, in Northeast England and maybe not stopping to travel, but in the context of what you were referring to earlier, kind of refusing to be lost anymore, that what that was like for you over the course of these these last years and Finally, what it was like to decide to turn your learning upon the world in the context of a school called Home in Ostervalla. I hope I pronounced that properly. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, for a start, these past, what is it, three years or so, have... I think for a lot of us who have found ourselves living somewhere other than where we were born, that got a lot more real. If you'd been born with the right passport and you had always experienced the world as a place you could move around almost frictionlessly, then the restrictions, not just the lockdowns within countries, but the raising of borders between countries, countries and the making it difficult to travel was a new and shocking experience for a lot of people and it was a particularly strange experience living in Sweden because as as many people know this country did not follow the same path as most of the western countries in its response to covid and sometimes that gets exaggerated and sometimes it gets understated. But it was very clear as a lived experience for me. Firstly, in that COVID spring of 2020, when during those strange weeks when the world slid sideways and, you know, these concepts like lockdown that until that point had been, you know, that was a policy for dealing with prison riots. And suddenly it was a word that everybody was using and that seemed like, obvious to everyone that that was the right response if you you know listen to a lot of progressive folks and mainstream media and so on and like i'm not embedded on any side within the covid culture war i think we're missing so much because of the way that these stories have been polarized and they've led us into various seemingly opposing states of delusion but to be sitting in Sweden as country after country made these very radical decisions and told their people, you know, we're doing this because we're following the science. And we took our son out of daycare for a few days. And then as it became clear that things were not going to close down here in the same way that they were doing elsewhere, we put him back in and, you know, we adapted our lives, things became quieter and closer to home. There was advice and there were some restrictions here. But meanwhile, you know, 
So firstly, I go through this thing of everyone who's been born and grown up in Sweden finds it so easy to trust the Swedish system. Swedish exceptionalism is very quiet and understated, but it is as deep rooted and as made from steel or granite as American exceptionalism. It just doesn't shout about it as loudly. Mm. They, there is something extraordinary about this country's capacity to be comfortable with doing something other than what everyone else is doing. And it's not always or even often done for the right reasons, but it's just a product of this peculiar history of how this became in its own eyes and in the eyes of much of the world, the world's most modern country in the 20th century and is therefore somehow also the world's last modern country in the 21st century. And so I, I couldn't share that ease that my partner and my friends who had grown up here had as my friends in the UK and the US were sending me these charts and going, it's going to, you know, it's going to go to hell in Sweden within weeks if your government doesn't do the same as our governments are doing. You know, I shared their fears as I looked at those projections. And then as the weeks and months went by and, you know, there are loads of arguments to be had, you can get into the depths of the data, but the basic experience is of having been told if your government doesn't do this then your society will be entering a state of collapse within weeks because of the spread of the virus and the consequences of it and that not happening that was nothing close to that was what happened here so that was a really that, that was an interesting experience let's say and then meanwhile, just witnessing the slow drift apart of the state of mind and state of being that was kind of the center of gravity of where people were at here compared to talking to friends and family in the UK that was going through a much more traumatic experience. And there are a hundred factors in why that was different. There's no simple, neat, tidy conclusion to be drawn from it. But I simply found myself very grateful to be living here rather than there in that time. And also it came home to me what it means that this is now my home in a way that it hadn't done in the first eight years of living here. Because suddenly it was, you know, however much my mind might continue to be pulled backwards and forwards between the Swedish world and the English speaking world. It is the case at a bodily level that I am subject to the decisions of the Swedish government in a way that I'm not subject to the decisions of the British government. And I was already sufficiently at home here to be able to embrace that experience as an acceptance of this now being where, oh, all things being equal, I expect to end my days. For other people who were less rooted here, I think that was a much, much harder thing to, to process and to live through. So you asked about the school as well. Yes. That goes back again to this conversation in Oaxaca in 2012 when Anna and I admitted to each other that it was time to come home. And she said, right, she would look for a job in Swedish local government rather than the work that she was doing that was taking her backwards and forwards to Palestine and Israel and elsewhere in the Middle East. And I said, I would turn down new international projects in the coming year and I would sign up for Swedish classes for immigrants. And so I got to sit there and be taught how to be an immigrant. And I learned a bit of Swedish along the way. I experienced this. Illich, again, knew this so well and spoke of this so well. There is a vulnerability and helplessness as an adult entering into a new language as a beginner that is very hard to have otherwise if you are in any way privileged as an adult within modern societies. And so I was sat mostly alongside these you know, folks who had arrived here from Syria, fleeing from war and the collapse of their society our lives were so different you know i'm sweden's most privileged kind of immigrant as a white native english speaker i can get away with so much you know my mistakes in my swedish people praise me for how good my swedish is rather than going oh yeah you see they never really learn it 
but we were at least in this condition of mutual helplessness as total beginners in a new language in adult life. And that's pretty humbling. And it also allows you to re-experience what was done to you when you were six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old with the eyes and the defenses of grown up and go, oh, yeah, I remember teachers like that one. The ones who enjoy the power that they have in the classroom or the ones who just do everything by the rules. And then those few who, for one reason or another, are able to lay down the power that they are formally given and make the classroom into a space of humans being human together. So I lived all of that as a result of that decision made on this rooftop in Oaxaca. But in that conversation as well, Anna and I had admitted to ourselves, admitted to each other that we were ready to leave Stockholm and the big city and find somewhere smaller And that sooner or later, we would want to create something together that wove together the the networks of conversation, the kind of hammock of conversation, as Gustavo would say, and the friendships and collaborations. And Anna said partway through that conversation, whatever we end up creating, it can't be a centre. It can't be an institution. It has to be our home. And whatever else it is starts from and returns to that. So we often say it's a school that starts from the conversations that happen around our kitchen table, the conversations we bring together around that table and then extending that. So our international fellowship that we've been working with over the last two and a half years is called The Long Table in honour of that. So it was a good number of years between that conversation and us doing anything to begin to make a reality of the school. And it was the autumn when I turned 40. And I had a particular experience, a trip back to London. And on my way home, I taught for a couple of days at the Chaos Pilots School in Denmark, which I had visited a number of times over the years. But I experienced that something had happened where rather than teaching being something at the edge of my work, something I got invited to do sometimes and was trying to figure out my way of doing, something happened in that room with that group of students. And for weeks and weeks afterwards, every day, my phone was pinging with messages from these young people who I had spent those two days with. And I still hear from some of them and have contact from some of them from that group. And it was like, ah, okay, it's time to show up in this role of teacher as I have not been ready or ripe for before. And so then we stumbled into this process of creating something that might be called a school. And that thing of it being being ripe, it being time... Reminds me of a story from Alan Garner, who is a friend and an extraordinary figure. He's very old now. It's the same, he was born the same year as Gustavo. He's a a novelist who grew up in this patch of land in Cheshire where people of his family had lived for at least the last 400 years and probably longer. That's just how far back they can trace it in the records. And who was the first child of this family of craftsmen who had a very strong, you know, within their own world, elitist craft culture. He was the first to get a grammar school education and then go to university. And he went to Oxford and he was on track. Everyone thought he would become chair of classical Greek at Oxford. And instead, he left the term before his final exams because he found that he needed to go home and try to tell the stories of his people bringing what he had learned from there. And it took him another 20 years and five or six books before he began to arrive at the place where he could write something that his father could read and go, yeah, ah, that's a good bit there. And he told me one time about an encounter he had had with an old Uzbek storyteller who must have been visiting, or maybe they were at the same international event together or whatever. But he said, yes, this this old man, he, he gave me his hat. And to be given this hat was a serious act of recognition from 
someone in one culture to someone in another culture of a mutuality in the roles that they played because this was no small thing this had and he said yeah and he told me that when he was eight years old he had been chosen alongside two other boys by the old storyteller and gone to live in his household and be part of the life of the household and train with him and when they were 18 years old the other two were sent back to live on the ordinary path of village life and this one guy carried on as the storyteller's apprentice when he was about 40 he was allowed to tell a story in front of an audience for the first time and that is how seriously traditional cultures have taken the kind of work that we do and you know that's because it is a matter of life and death in ways we do not even have words for as children of a failing modernity but just carrying that story and being able to recognize in my experience at the age of 40 for the first time feeling like i wasn't you know i wasn't faking it when i tried to teach what i knew and had learned from the various people who had helped me find my bearings and begin to make some maps of my own and when you're starting as stephen jenkinson says in an orphan culture where you don't have these intergenerational lineages available in any ordinary way to you nonetheless these patterns still show up and then now at the age of 45 having been someone who was writing a book for 30 years i've finally actually written a book and have to let go of that identity and that too feels like a version of you know being that storyteller who's finally let out in public mm, wow well I, I imagine that many of those stories that arrive as seeds in the school in a school called home that you and your wife pray over as a uh, a great deal to offer our times and the times we'll be headed into. I'd like to ask finally, as it's come to my attention that you have a great deal of travel ahead of you in the coming months, how might our listeners get in touch with you and your wife via the school? How might they find out about your upcoming events and how might they finally purchase at work in the ruins? Well, thank you for asking that question, Chris. The school itself is in a bit of a chrysalis phase at the moment, so we don't have our doors open to new participants or members right now because we're in the process of handing over to the community that has grown around this long table over the last two and a half years, going from a position where Anna and I are holding that to it being held mutually and that's a journey that we're on over the next half year and partly that's knowing that i don't know what my world and life and work will look like on the far side of the journey i'm about to take this book on so half a year from now perhaps things will look clearer in ways that will take me by surprise but the simplest way to follow my work and hear about things is actually to find me on Substack. And I have a Substack called Writing Home. And the address is dougal.substack.com. The book at Work in the Ruins is coming out on the 9th of February. And it should be available through most of the channels through which people find their books, whether it's the big global online ones or the little local ones that act as pockets of life in high streets and elsewhere. And there's an audio book version of it as well that will be out there in the places where you find audio books. I am heading out by train across Europe in February, Frankfurt, Brussels, London, going up to the Isle of Skye to visit Ian McGilchrist and talk to him about all of this and then doing events in Glasgow and Newcastle and Sheffield and 
at Dartington Hall and in Stroud with Gail Bradbrook from Extinction Rebellion and then Norwich and then Brighton and then London and then Paris and then home again, though, possibly visiting my brother Bio Akomalafe in Hamburg on the way home because he and his family are just finding themselves at home there for half a year or so. So I hope that we will cross paths. So that's the that's the journey that lies ahead of me in these coming weeks. And I suppose the one other thing is working with Felix Marquardt, who I spoke about, who I was having that conversation with that was the moment of inception of the book. Working with him and this strange, wonderful, curious mysterious thing called Black Elephant that he has co-founded, which is working with the storyteller Martin Shaw and the theologian Elizabeth Oldfield and the theorist of the sacred and the political Reed Wildermuth and all sorts of other wonderful people to convene a gathering this June on Patmos, the island of the apocalypse in Greece, where we are going to be meeting for three days in the name of meta plus physics. And Felix always says this was kind of, in some sense, emergent from the conversations that he and I were having over the last few years where he had this deep attachment to the history of Eranos and the meetings that Jung was responsible for, or partly responsible for organizing there in Europe in the 20th century. And I had this deep attachment to the story of Cuernavaca and the Center for Intercultural Documentation and the way that Illich and his friends brought people together in that moment in the 60s and 70s. And so somehow in amongst all of the chaos, among the ruins and the the foolishness, we are attempting to convene something. And Anna and I are working with this as well, that will have its first form this June on Patmos. So wish us luck on this foolish endeavor. That sounds so fascinating and intense. All the links to Black Elephant, to At Work in the Ruins, and the rest of your work is available on the End of Tourism website. And I wish that the gods be prevailing on this path of pilgrimage that you were perhaps set to take in your days. And as well, I'd like to offer a little thank you to our mutual friend, James Novak, for making this happen. Yes, thank you, James. And thank you, Dougal, for your time today on behalf of our listeners. It's been a great honor, it really has. Thank you, Chris. It's been, it's been a real pleasure to, to spend this bit of time together. Thanks for listening, everyone. For more, you can check out the homework section under each episode on our website at theendoftourism.com. We'd also like to offer a deep bow of gratitude for our patrons who ensure that the project keeps growing and so that all of you can listen without a paywall. In this way, we participate in the gift economy and invite you to do the same via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash theendoftourism. Likewise, you can follow us on social media via the handle theendoftourism. Until next time. Farewell, friends.